Okay. I'd like to um, welcome everyone and to get started, we're just um, getting everyone ready to sit down and to make everyone yourselves comfortable. I'd like to introduce myself to people that probably don't know me or who I am or haven't really seen me very much. My name is Jean James. I'm the one that you get these emails from over the period of time and urging you to come along to our meetings and be part of our Yom Society. And I'd like to welcome everybody to come along here tonight. Um, it's quite a commitment for everyone. It's always very nice to see new people um, and to sometimes we're trying to rope in new people all the time and um, young people. We want to really, and older people, and middle-aged people of all ages who are interested in Jung because Jung is a very interesting person and we need to be aware of a lot of his um, ways of thinking. So we're also um, joining, joining in people online. So welcome to those people. This evening, we're delighted to see Shauna and welcome again, Shauna. Um, she's a, a young life member and well known to most of us through her lovely newsletters over the years. Shauna is completing a PhD in philosophy at ANU. She has an interest in consciousness and psychosis and her thesis attempts to show how changes in consciousness affect the experiences of psychosis. Shauna will give us some tools to think more deeply and clearly about consciousness. By thinking clearly, we come to a closer understanding of this mysterious phenomenon. Shauna will talk for about an hour and let her complete her presentation without interrupting would be very good. Thank you. And then we'll break for 15 minutes for tea and coffee, and then resume with questions and discussions and finish by about 10, 10 o'clock as we have a lovely supper here. You're very welcome to that. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to a library. If you are a member, you can borrow a selection of books there. And we're just newly acquiring the complete works of the Jung, Jungian. Um, it's going to cost the Young Society $500. Um, we're wealthy enough to be able to do that. But if you'd like to donate for that um, donations, little donations of $20 or $50 would be quite welcome for that project. Because it is a big undertaking. And people in the committee have taken a lot of time and effort to um, find that. And thanks to our librarian, Robbie, and thanks to Trish and to other people on the committee, we have been able to find those books, which is rather rare and rather precious. So we'll have more books for you to peruse um, next time when you come. So if you don't want to be photographed, just let Robert know. Um, well, we are um, online. There's a few people online tonight. And if you're here online, please remain muted with Shauna is, when Shauna is speaking to avoid background noise. You can always make comments using the Zoom chat chat button. So I'd like to hand over to Shauna to do and to say thank you in advance. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather tonight and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, 
Look, it's great being here tonight. I want to thank Jean and Robert for inviting me. I gave a talk here a year ago and I really enjoyed it. So I'm really excited to be doing this again. Um, last year, I've got these glasses on because I can see that with these glasses, but I can't see you all <laughs> clearly behind. No, no, thanks. So you're all a bit blurred to me, I'm sorry. But um, I gave a talk here last year and I asked for a lot of audience participation. I'm not going to do that this year, just a little bit of participation at the beginning and then I'm just going to go launch straight into the talk. Um, but it, it, the talk is a bit dense, but it's only about 40 or 45 minutes. So hopefully it'll be okay. And if you do want to stop me along the way to ask something, feel free. Um, this isn't a Jungian talk, but as Jungians, we're interested in the unconscious. So I think having a grasp about what this conversation around consciousness is, is also really relevant. So anyway, I'll launch into it now. Um, this is based on a paper I wrote last year. It's a draft, so it's a work in progress. I haven't worked everything out yet. Um, but anyway, the paper, yeah, you can, here we go. The paper was based um, on a paper by a guy called Tim Bain. Uh, his paper was called Conscious States and Conscious Creatures. And in that paper, he talks about the structure of consciousness. Now, I'll explain what the structure of consciousness is in a moment. But firstly, there are two models to the structure of consciousness in the literature, the building block model and the unified field model. And Tim Bain argues for the unified field model. So in my paper, I try to determine if that's a good model. And I say that it's committed to three claims and I show some problems with those claims. So uh, in this talk, I'll begin by giving some definitions, which I'll go into a bit of detail in, which is consciousness and related terms, and also explaining what the structure of consciousness is. Um, then I'll talk about the building block model. And <laughs> when I talk about the building block model, uh, I'll also go into the neural correlates of consciousness. <coughs> So my work's uh, interested in the science of consciousness and the neural correlates is basically the neural activity when we have consciousness. So I'll explain a bit about that. Then I'll talk about the unified field model and I'll briefly go into the three claims I think it's committed to. And then I'll go into detail uh, about one of those claims, which is that consciousness is global. And I'll discuss what I some problems with that. Okay, so we'll begin with some definitions. So consciousness is a term that has a variety of meanings and the type of consciousness I'm interested in is called phenomenal consciousness. And this is the type of consciousness that poses a problem to science. And this is often known as a hard problem of consciousness. And the problem is basically how does this kind of lump of, you know, this, this lump of meat, which is a brain that we have, which is basically just a lump of neurons, how does it give rise to this rich first person experience that we have? Now, this is the audience participation part. <laughs> Just to get an idea of why this is a bit of a problem, I'll ask you all to shut your eyes now. So to shut your eyes now, imagine you're at the beach. So visualize a beach. You can hear the waves in the background can feel the sun. Now you're holding a coconut, you're drinking a bit of coconut milk. Okay, now open your eyes. Now, I imagine most of you got some kind of beach-like image then. You probably didn't taste the coconut milk, but you probably got some vague beach-like image. Most people can imagine that. But if we cut your skull open and look look inside your brain, we're not going to find that picture of the beach. Okay, so this is the problem we have that our third person methods of science, how we measure or look at the physical world is not going to get at this rich first person experience that we have. Okay, so um, in the philosophy of mind, which is the area of philosophy I'm sort of in, uh, this is often known in terms of the mind 
body problem. So what's the relationship between the mind and the brain? And people who are physicalists, so they believe that the universe is wholly physical, uh, which is most scientists and a lot of philosophers, they, they assume we're going to, well, they think we should be able to answer this via neuroscience. Uh, but there's a couple of philosophical arguments that suggest that science and physicalism is not going to be able to solve this problem. And just as a bit of background into my interest, when I first became interested in this, I was very uh, interested in the idea of consciousness being spread throughout the universe. And there are philosophers who hold that position. But I wanted to know what the physicalists were saying, what the science was saying. So my research has sort of gone in the direction of the brain. You know. So anyway, so I'll go back to phenomenal consciousness. Um, phenomenal consciousness has this quality. So when I look at the red apple, the red has a certain quality. And when I bite into the apple, the apple has a certain taste. Uh, so we, we access reality by these qualities, but as well as having a qualitative aspect, phenomenal consciousness has this subjective aspect because these qualities are happening to a subject of experience. Um, so basically the problem we have is science can kind of tell us the functions of what the brain is doing, but it can't get at this rich first person experience, these qualitative experiences that we're having. So that's phenomenal consciousness. So when you think about our consciousness uh, and you think, what are the contents? Like, what can we be aware of in consciousness? What are the contents or conscious mental states that we have? And these are things like perceptions, like my uh, perception of the red apple or my perception of my cat or emotions like the joy I feel when I see my cat or sensations like the pain I can feel in my neck or thoughts like my thought I want a coffee or the image of the beach. These are basically the sort of things that we can be conscious of. So conscious mental states or contents don't amount to much more than these things. Okay, so I'll keep going with definitions. Creature consciousness just refers to the distinction between a creature being conscious as opposed to unconscious. And obviously that's an important distinction. But when we're conscious, we're conscious in a, a particular way. So for example, at the moment, we're all in a normal waking state, but if we were in a coma or non-REM sleep would be unconscious. But there are these other ways of being conscious like REM dreaming, the hypnotic state, dementia, delirium, stupor. Um, these are called global states or modes. So these different ways of being conscious um, are these modes of consciousness. And um, arguably there's a psychotic mode and a psychedelic mode. And so my thesis is interested in working out this psychotic mode, but I won't go into that in this talk. Okay, so we'll keep going. Oh, so we've got these different ways of being conscious, right? Um, that raises the question, well, what dis distinguishes one mode from another? So how do these different ways of being conscious vary? And in the clinical literature, and that's interested in uh, people who are in a coma, whatever, they talk about these different ways of being conscious in terms of levels. And when they talk about levels, they measure consciousness on one dimension, and that's arousal or wakefulness. So uh, the clinical literature is, of, you, you can have someone in a coma or someone can be in a locked in state where they're conscious but non-responsive. So this literature is trying to work with brain damaged people or whatever. But um, yes, so the, they're measure, measuring consciousness on this one dimension of arousal or wakefulness where you have a coma, there's no arousal, you'll have something like a minimally conscious state, you'll have a normal waking state and then if a drug like speed will put you up here or whatever. But um, there are some philosophers and they argue that this is uh, inadequate. We need more than just this one way of measuring these differences. So they argue for a multi-dimensional way of distinguishing these different ways of being conscious from each other. Okay, so uh, that raises the question, how do these different modes vary from each other? Um, so, 
One way is the bandwidth or the number of contents you experience at a given time. So remember I said conscious mental states are things like perceptions, sensations, emotions, thoughts. Well, in any given moment, we'll experience numerous of those. And in the psychological literature, they try and measure this in terms of how many chunks of information a person can have in working memory. Um, and it's normal, normally averaged at around four, but it's hard to measure bandwidth. But the idea is that if you're in a minimally conscious state, you're going to have a lower bandwidth. If you're on LSD, you're going to have a bigger bandwidth than if you're in a normal conscious state. Um, another way they can vary is in terms of the quality of the contents. So if you're in a minimally conscious state, you're only going to represent basic features like loudness and hue. Whereas if you're in a normal conscious state, you'll represent complex features like individual faces and social cues and things. Uh, quality can vary in other ways in terms of complexity and intensity and things. Um, there's also the way that attention is spread across the things we're conscious of. So in a normal waking state, there's a distinction between what's in the center or the focus of our attention and what's on the periphery. But it's suggested that if you take a drug like ketamine, that um, attention will be spread more evenly across the things you're aware of. Um, there's also work on it, how we control our attention as well. Uh, now, these, these different modes can also vary in terms of how time is experienced. So in a normal waking state, uh, we don't experience the present just kind of this, this momentary thing. It's normally experienced as, as what's called a specious present, which is about a few seconds that we kind of exist within. And the idea is that in some disorders that can vary like ADHD, Parkinson's disease or um, schizophrenia, that can vary. And in delirium, it can seem like the past and present coexist for subjects. Um, and the last one I'll mention is how accessible these contents, so the contents, perceptions, emotions, sensations, how accessible they are to consuming systems. Now, these are systems in the brain that look after things like verbal report, decision making, motor control, working memory, things like that. And the idea is if you're in REM dreaming, uh, you, you have contents of consciousness, but those contents aren't going to be able to be used in decision making or working memory because those systems are sort of offline. Whereas if you're in a normal waking state, those contents can be used by those systems. Okay, so I'll go on with some more definitions. Um, a phenomenal field or a field of consciousness is just sort of the totality of what we're conscious of in a given moment. And the stream of consciousness is just that field over time. Um, now, the next one is the unity of consciousness. This is an idea uh, that certain philosophers hold. It's kind of the dominant pos position in the literature, but not everyone holds it. But the idea is um, this picture is the outside world, the top picture. So say I'm in my study, I can see my laptop, I can hear the birds outside and I can smell the coffee. So they're different states of consciousness that I'm experiencing at a given time. The idea is that whilst they're different states, I'm a unified subject, Shauna. So I have this one phenomenal perspective on the world. So those different states are going to be experienced in a unified way. And I'll talk a bit more about this later on. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll mention it a bit more later. But So now we're up to the structure of consciousness. Okay, so remember I said, you can see the laptop, you can hear the birds, and you can smell the coffee. So these are three distinct states that I'm experiencing. Now imagine that each of those states is one of the colourful building blocks. Is my total conscious experience in a given moment just the sum of those states? Um, that's what the building block model says. But uh, the unified field model is, say, we have this unified, the, the surface of the water is meant to represent this unified field of subjectivity. 
And the idea is that this unified field has sort of some explanatory priority. So if you have a state like you hear the birds, that's kind of like a pebble dropping into that field and modulating that field. And that's a unified field model. I'll go into these two models in more detail now. Okay. So first, the building block model. Um, so it says that this phenomenal field, what the totality of what we're experiencing in a given moment is made up of these distinct building blocks of experiences. So the idea is I see the laptop and there are, there are neurons that are kind of correlated with that experience. I hear the birds, there are neurons correlated with that and I smell the coffee and there are neurons correlated with that. And the idea is that the totality of my experience in that given moment is just the sum of that neural activity. And uh, this also leads to another thing, which is that consciousness has multiple generating systems. So O'Brien and Opie say this, I'll say there's a different system for each of the senses. So I see the screen, there's this generating system generating that visual consciousness. I hear the birds, there's another generating system generating that. I smell the coffee, there's another generating system. And so these systems are running in parallel and my, my conscious experience is the totality of that activity. Okay, now a problem with this, there's uh, research that supports this idea, but a problem is the research is carried out on subjects or monkeys, a lot of it's done on monkeys, <laughs> that are conscious. So it, it doesn't tell you the difference between why a creature is conscious as opposed to unconscious. So for example, say I'm looking at the red rose and my visual cortex at the back of my brain, you kind of find this, this uh, neural activity that's correlated with me looking at the red rose, but then I shut my eyes and that neural activity stops, but I'm still conscious. So that's a problem with this model. But um, it might be a good idea to talk about the neural correlates now, because this will, this will, it's relevant. <laughs> um, so they're the minimum set of neural activities or mechanisms that are required for specific conscious experiences like seeing the red rose or hearing the violin. Now they're called correlates. Uh, we don't say they cause consciousness because remember I said there's this hard problem of consciousness. Science hasn't been able to account for phenomenal consciousness. So uh, it's not it's not called causation, but most people who are physicalists would say that it's more than a correlation because it, it, this neural activity is necessary for these conscious experiences. But um, I said the, the neural activity is uh, responsible for specific states. And remember I said states were things like perceptions, emotions, sensations, and thoughts. This neural activity, it's also uh, distinguishes between a cre the creature consciousness, I said, the difference between a creature being conscious as opposed to unconscious. So picture of the brain. <laughs> I don't really know a lot about the brain, but the, I don't know if you can see, can you see, oh, is it my glasses or is that, is that, <laughs> is that quite clear? <laughs> it's very blue, is it blue? <laughs> Oh no, they can't see that. Um, anyway, the colourful stuff around the outside, that's the cortex, and that evolved later. And right in the centre, there's a round structure, and that's called the thalamus. And then down the bottom uh, and to the bottom right, you have the subcortical structures, which are earlier structures. So um, for specific states, you need activation in the cortex and the thalamus. So if I see the red rose, the green at the back, is the visual system. You have activation in the, the visual system in the thalamus. Um, but for, for a creature to be conscious as opposed to unconscious, you have activation in the thalamus and these sub certain subcortical structures. And if you have damage to those subcortical structures, um, you'll end up in a coma. Okay. But um, the interesting thing is for consciousness, you need activation in the cortex, the thalamus, and these specific subcortical structures. And that activation also has to be integrated. So Bain talks about this in terms of a cortical thalamic loop. Um, 
And the reason this is interesting, and I'll go into this a bit further in the talk, I won't go into it a lot, but uh, the, the unified field model seems to suggest, some readings of it seems to suggest that you can have this unified field without states. And that's the sort of thing you hear in mystical traditions where you have this pure awareness or consciousness without states that you hear in meditative traditions or mystical traditions. And on this reading of it, it, that doesn't seem possible. You seem to need activation in the cortex or you need states embedded within this unified field for there to be consciousness. But there's more literature in that, on that um, pure awareness that I haven't gone into. So, you know, there, there's more to be said on this that I can't say, but um, I'll talk a bit about that later. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about the unified field model now. Um, it's committed to the claim that consciousness is unified, and I'll discuss that a bit in, the mo in a moment. But as I said, it's this idea that you have this unified field of subjectivity. So uh, proponents of this model are kind of seeking to find out how the brain produces this unified field. So whereas a building block model you see the screen, you're trying to find those neurons, you hear the birds, those neurons, you smell the coffee, those neurons. Um, this is this model, we, you're trying to find this, This I'll, you can turn the next slide now, or two slides along. Um, this model kind of says there's this one generating system that generates consciousness. And uh, you're trying to find this one generating system. So. As I said, where the building block model says you have these, or O'Brien and Opie say you have these distinct systems uh, for each of the senses, this is saying you have this one system. So whilst you still have distinct states, you still see the screen, hear the birds, smell the coffee, it's like they have some something under, underlying that, that unifies them. They have a common element, those distinct states. Okay. So, um, thank you. This, this model is committed to the unity of consciousness. So Bain actually says that the unified field model uh, explains the unity of consciousness. So he assumes that consciousness is unified. Not, not everyone holds that position, but it's dominant in the literature and it's held by Searle, Bain and Chalmers and Pai, for example. So uh, Bain and Chalmers, that they, whilst they agree, you have these distinct states, you see the screen, you hear the birds, you smell the coffee. They say that these states seem to be tied together in a deep way. They seem to be unified by being aspects of a single encompassing state of consciousness. Okay, so I'll just ex explain this a bit more. I'm saying what I said earlier when I talked about the unity of consciousness, that this is me here and that's my head, empty head up there. And this is the outside world. So I'm seeing the screen, hearing the birds and smelling the coffee. And when we experience that, you, we're somehow representing that in our brains. Um, and the idea is that I'm this, this unified, I have one center of consciousness. I'm a unified person, I'm Shauna. So when I experience these conscious uh, different states, I experience them in a unified way from the one phenomenal perspective. And, People who support the unity of consciousness, they talk about examples where this unity breaks down. And the main example they use is split brain cases. So split brain patients have had the corpus callosum severed, which that connects the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. And they've had that severed to stop epileptic seizures spreading from one hemisphere to the next. And these people seem normal most of the time, but in certain experimental situations, they seem to have two centers of consciousness. So they seem to be two distinct personalities. For example, experimenters will ask the right hemisphere something and they'll ask the left hemisphere something and they'll get different answers. As though there are two people responding to them. And um, another example is um, disassociative identity disorder which used to be known as multiple personality disorder. So, yes, yeah, so there are these examples where this kind of unity breaks down for people who support it. Um, anyway, in, in my paper, I said that because this unified field model 
assumes that consciousness is unified, it's committed to three extra <coughs> claims. Um, and the first one is that consciousness is global, and I'll go into that in a moment. The second one is that uh, if you have this unified field, it, some of the readings seem to suggest you can have the, the states of consciousness are separate from this unified field. So we can have a unified field without states. And that's what I said uh, is the example of the mystical traditions where people talk about pure awareness or, or consciousness with no contents. And Searle also, he's one of the philosophers who writes um, on the unity of consciousness, sort of, he gives the example of when I'm asleep and then I wake up, but my eyes are shut. There's this kind of background consciousness in virtue of which I'm awake. And then when I open my eyes, that information sort of uh, modulates that, that field or background consciousness. Um, that doesn't seem right to me. I, th I think, you know, if, if I'm awake with my eyes shut, there are contents of consciousness in virtue of which I'm conscious. Uh, anyway, so, but th there's more literature on this. I've got a friend who does think uh, there's pure awareness and there's a lot of stuff I haven't read. So, you know, I, I don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> but um, the third thing is uh, this is quite an interesting idea as well. Bain and Chalmers say this in their paper, but um, the idea is uh, that this unified field has a distinct phenomenology. So I'll explain that. Say in a given moment, I'm, I'm aware of the screen, I can hear the birds, I can smell the coffee, and each of those has you know, certain qualities. It seems the totality of my experience just is the sum of those qualities. And they seem to be saying as well as those qualities, there's this overarching state that has a quality or a phenomenology that I'm also experiencing. And that sort of sounded, that didn't sound right to me. And then I read something about a condition uh, called pain asymbolia. And that's when someone experiences pain, but they say it's not their own. And the idea is that there's this depersonalization. And so, uh, why that supports this kind of uh, unified field or this, this subjective field is that we have this kind of subjective field that we don't normally notice and it makes our experiences feel like they belong to us. But when it's missing, our experiences don't feel like they belong to us. So I thought that was really convincing idea for this unified field thing. And then I gave this talk to the students I work with at uni and very bright student called Brandon pointed out that if you're arguing that to be conscious, you need this unified field, but someone's feeling pain and it's not part of that unified field, then it seems you don't need this unified field to be conscious. So that's a work in progress. I don't know the answer to that either, but it, it, it kind of seems interesting. Um, anyway, I'll talk about consciousness being global. So remember I said the unified, uh, the phenomenal field is everything you're conscious of in a given moment. Well, the idea with consciousness being global is that whatever happens to this field happens to the whole field. So this leads to two things I'll discuss. One's phenomenal holism and the other is that these modes or different ways of being conscious are domain general. I'll pull this apart a bit more now. So here we have Sammy and River and they're both sound asleep. So the idea with phenomenal holism is that when you go from consciousness to unconsciousness, and then back from unconsciousness to consciousness, all of those senses kind of go offline at the same time and they come online at the same time. Because you've got this unified field, that they're all part of, so it all, it all kind of dims down and goes back up. Um, so when Sammy goes to sleep, you know, her sense of smell, her hearing, her sight, it all kind of turns off at the same time. Um, now, I don't know if this is a good counter example or counter argument, but uh, say that I said that these subcortical structures lead to arousal. The idea is that this arousal happens to, <laughs> to different parts, uh, different senses or whatever at different times. This, this is a counter argument I thought of. I don't know if it works, but the idea 
is uh, say when we wake up, our sense of proprioception comes online. We know where our limbs are and our body is. And that seems to come online before our ability to think rationally. Um, but what this... <laughs> Mine's so down by that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, it's kind of taking them apart, yeah. you know. But whether that works or not, um, this is a problem. As I said, this is a work in progress. And I don't know uh, if this, in cognitive science, they, they kind of talk about perception as being processed differently to cognition, perhaps. And so this may not work by pulling them apart, but the idea is that you can kind of pull these things apart so they're not global, they're not all happening at the same time. Um, Another kind of counter argument from a Brian and Opie, they're, they're kind of the main people I looked at who, who disagree with this unified field model. But we're talking about consciousness, how it works. There's this model of consciousness called global workspace theory by a guy called Bernard Bars. And the idea is you, you see the screen, um, hear the birds, smell the coffee. Before that information becomes conscious, it goes through that thal a system in the thalamus and it's all bound together into this one kind of thing and then it's broadcast across the brain. So the idea of global workspace theory is that consciousness emerges. It, it is this workspace where the things that are conscious can be broadcast to more subsystems in the brain. So it's broadcast as one recording and the idea is a single track recording. So you have the Beatles, you have John, Paul, George and Ringo playing in your lounge room. You've got your tape recorder. You press, press play and record at the same time. You record the whole thing as one thing. And then when you play it back, you can't change the levels on Ringo's drums up and down because it's the one recording. That's kind of what you're talking about with the unified field model, is you're just getting this one recording being played. Whereas uh, Brian and Opie are suggesting this multi-track recording. That's the building block model. So you record John, Paul, George, Ringo all separately. They get played together, but you can change the levels because they're, they're on a different recording. Okay, so, so the idea is with the global, consciousness being global, that's the first thing. The one recording is that global recording um, because it's all, all happens. Okay, that, that's fairly clear. I hope it is. Okay, um, well, look, uh, another counterexample from a Brian and Opie again is that information processing occurs in different parts of the brain. So we look at the visual cortex, uh, different parts of it process different things like different parts process motion or colour or face recognition. And then you have damage to the face recognition part, then you can't recognise faces. And the idea is that consciousness isn't global because um, there are these different parts of the cortex that can be damaged, that damage different types of consciousness, like face recognition or whatever. I don't know if a, if a counter argument to that is that it's these subcortical structures that allow overall arousal, and when they're damaged, you end up in a coma. So maybe that's more of a global thing, is that if you, if you damage those structures, you won't have consciousness at all. Okay. Um, now, this wonderful picture. I'm sorry about this picture. I just thought it was so good. <laughs> um, okay, so these modes or different ways of being conscious. Um, now, the argument is that they're domain general if, you, if consciousness is global. So uh, let's see if I can explain this. It, so remember I said when the modes vary, there are different dimensions. So it's not just arousal. It's the number of contents, the quality of contents, etc. Well, this another way of thinking. Think if you're in a, in a, uh, you're under light anaesthetic, and you're moving into a normal waking state. Well, um, you you predict that for that to happen, all of the senses are going to be moving from that state to that state. But the building block model wouldn't predict that if if there are different generating systems for each of the senses then perhaps your, your sight would go be like it was on LSD, your hearing would be like in a normal waking state, and your smell would be like you're under anaesthetic. It was like these kind of senses can come apart and they don't, they don't all join. And that, 
the idea of being domain general is that they all kind of move together. If they're domain specific, they, they can go off in different directions. Um, so, I mean, this kind of assumes that these global, these global states are these kind of collections of dimensions. And that's, that, that is still an assumption. Like in my thesis, I'm trying to say that psychosis, well, I'm trying to determine is psychosis this kind of way of being conscious, this, this global state or mode of consciousness. And what we have in psychosis is different ways of, different types of delusions that people experience. So, you know, does, does that kind of come together in the one way of being conscious or does that, you know, constitute different ways? Um, anyway, I'll move on. You, you might you might move on to the next slide and then to the next one, Dar. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, now the next one. Because do you want to move to the next one? Okay. Oh um, no, not that one. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh no, drama. Okay, we're nearly there. <laughs> so um Okay, this is the way I tried to think through this problem. Like I said, this is a work in progress, so I don't have answers to these things. Um, I'd need to do a lot more work. But there's this paper by Bain and Carter, and what they're trying to determine is, is being on psychedelics a higher state of consciousness than the normal waking state. And what they do is they measure it on three subjective dimensions. One's sensation and perception, the other is cognition, and the other is the experience of time. And the idea is that with sensation and perception, experiences are a lot more complex and um, uh, intense. Whereas with complex cognition, you, um, the, it's, it's not, it, you're not performing as well. So the idea is you can't say psychedelics are a higher state because there are these different dimensions that you can measure them along. And um, so, uh, so yes, when talking about this uh, domain generalness of, of um, these states, I was, I was thinking that, well, if perception and sensation kind of go in that direction and cognition go in that direction, then you're not saying that the, that the whole of consciousness is kind of going in the same direction, which is what you want from this idea of something being domain general. But there is all this information in cognitive science about, uh, and it's still, we still don't know how the, how the brain works, you know, and there's all this kind of talk about perception being modular and cognition maybe not being modular. And um, that would tie into all of this work. And I haven't done the work to tie all of that in and, and work this out. So whether it's an argument against domain generality the fact that perception goes in one direction and cognition goes in the other, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I think it's all really interesting and I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> stop about now, but I'll, I'll say what motivates this. We, I've mentioned global workspace theory already. There's another theory of consciousness called integrated, um, integrated information theory. These are two serious uh, theories that try and explain, I told you we have this hard problem of consciousness. Uh, these theories are pretty well supported by science. Um, so they seem to suggest that we have this unified field. So we need to take this unified field model seriously. Um, I've tried to suggest that it faces difficulties. Like I've, I've looked at the claim that consciousness is global, um, but it would need more empirical work. It, when you're talking about the structure of Consciousness, working out whether the building block model or the unified field model is best would require more empirical work. Um, and then that's it. That's a picture of me now <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> I thought I'd end with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, Sean has given us a lot to think about consciousness, and uh, Sean will be able to manage that, wouldn't it, won't you? Yes. <laughs> so, um, 
Is that right? And everyone was able to eat the supper, which is really great. Thanks very much for that. We don't really want to take too much of it home. And I'd like to draw your attention to our next meeting, which will be early May, with Mary Van de Graaff. Hmm. Does not make, make much difference. Yeah. It's only alive. I'm using my teacher's voice here. I don't need to be <laughs> amplified. I've tried my voice out once, and I can actually go from one end of the hall to the other with my voice. I've tried it out when I was trying to round up a whole lot of high school kids that were running amok. But I managed to um, get them all organised. So I've tested my voice. So I'd like to um, thank you very much for coming. And um, also with, uh, with Shauna, it's been a very interesting night. And it's really um, training our brains to think of consciousness when we go to sleep, and when we wake up. We'll think more about it. So thank you. I'll let you continue on. Hey, thank you. Thank you all. So if anyone's got any questions. <laughs> I was just explaining um, the idea of being, you know, in, into science and physicalism and being what people call a reductionist or whatever. I, I was explaining that um, to someone who doesn't know me that I, I'm not like that. I, I learn the science at uni and I find it very interesting, but I'm very Jungian. So I kind of... You know, I kind of have two different realities with this stuff I learn at uni, which is the, the physicalist stuff. And then, you know, the the way a lot of us here think of, you know, we we, we uh, draw ideas from Jung or whatever about the collective unconscious, or we, we have ideas. For example, when I was saying the split brain patients and having these two personalities, and then with Jung, a lot of us, have an idea that you know we we do have these sub personalities and um, you know that's that's quite normal even though it may may seem pathological or it may be problematic if if these if people experience voices or thought insertion or these kind of symptoms um, but a lot of us have an idea that there are these sub personalities for example so. So if you want to bring a Jungian twist on anything I've said, um, you know, really cool. I'm, I'm open to it. I'm just going to ask my said, um, I did like to say that um, we're recording your presentation, Sean, and um, also recording the question and answer session. So um, if uh, anyone has a question, I'll hand the microphone around and, and please just use the microphone just for the sake of the recording so that your question will uh, be, be heard. And I'll just mention that uh, Lauren, we've had half a dozen people listening in to your talk on Zoom. And Dorothea um, Thea Wagner has said, Dear Shauna, thank you for an interesting and informative presentation. You made a difficult topic easy to follow. And uh, thank you, Dorothea. Thank you, Dorothea. Okay. <laughs> and, there's, there's one question from somebody on Zoom, but perhaps we'll take some questions from here and, and then come back to that. So sure. I'll hand the, the microphone over. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you about um, just in the ANU, um, you know, neuroscience and philosophy, like the crossover, the Venn diagram between those two, like, is that? Does that make life easier? It's you know, or, or, or harder from a sort of you're doing a philosophy. I mean, philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So like the intersection of like people from neurosciences coming in and saying they have a uh, a view on how the structures of the brain and and consciousness. I don't. I don't think it really works that way. Um, the, the philosophy department that I'm in is mainly analytical philosophy. So um, a number of the people there, they, they lean very heavily on science. So philosophers don't actually collect data normally. Some do, but a lot don't. And what they do is they read the science and they write about, theorise about the science. Um, 
I mean, it's good if, if there's interdisciplinary work, but from what I know in the, uh, I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone that I know of in the philosophy department is working with people in neuroscience. Although, you know, it's good if that sort of thing happens, but I don't think it is happening. So I don't really know what they're doing in neuroscience. And you've probably heard ANU's cutting their neuroscience mm -hmm. because there's been a lot of problems with funding. Um, I think it's been cut, and so. Has it been abolished? Yeah. Um, the Department so, of Neuroscience has been abolished. Yeah, there's right. well, there's been a lot of budget problems it's anyway, but um, yeah. but philosophy. So so I don't know what goes on in neuroscience. I have nothing to do with it, and what I do is I I read philosophers who are reading that are, have an interest in cognitive science, neuroscience. Uh, philosophers have, have an interest in all of this stuff, you know, and they yeah, they kind of they they <clears throat> they look heavily at the science and and try to draw it into the the work that they're doing, and they they will use the science to support their arguments, you know. Yeah. So it, it kind of works that way, um, mostly. Uh, some philosophers collect. It started happening. It's called um, uh, XFI experimental philosophy where philosophers are actually going out and, and doing tests or surveys or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they're collecting the original data to work with. But normally philosophers are, you know, they, they're reading this stuff and, mm -hmm. and bringing it in. So I, I, guess, I guess just 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 um, one of the things that I've sort of read, I'm again total layman of this, this sort of stuff, but on a neuroscience perspective, was um, the default the default network in yeah. your in, in your mind and neuroplasticity sort of switching different parts of your mind and reconfiguring different parts of your mind and that seems to play into both of those two views philosophical views that you uh, talked about tonight yeah. so it kind of seemed to be supporting both of those uh, both of those two ideas so in, in, in different ways yeah I, I I don't know what to say about I mean, the default mode network, from my understanding, gives you a, it's a real sense of me, the I, when you, it's kind of activated when but you... But it can shift in hemispheres of the brain, like it can actually like be reconfigured in another part of the brain. For people who've had trauma in, in different parts of their brain, it's reconfigured to other parts of their brain. So that would seem to sort of, from a consciousness perspective, that would sort of seem to have, you know, field um, sort of stuff that you're talking about tonight, and also block, you know, that it can actually do, it can actually do both. Those, it, it, I mean, I, perhaps I haven't understood the philosophy no, no, well I, enough, but it, it just seemed to have characteristics of A and B. Okay. Okay. I, there is I, A and I, B. We could, we could pull this apart a bit yeah, more. But it, like, I would have to <clears> think <throat> about how it's acting as a field and how it's acting as a block. Well, you. You're saying um, well, because it's reconfigured, like part of the brain, part of the hemisphere of the brain has been damaged. Yeah, it's actually changed to a different side of the yep. brain. Yep. So that that's you know that sort of seemed to be it's reconfigured. It's reconf you know it's reconfigured itself onto another. Like, yep. I'm just uh, wondering. Uh, I guess. I don't know enough. No, no, I don't either. So I, I'm not. Um, I'm, try, I'm trying to respond, yeah. but I don't know enough to respond. Yeah. So I guess what would say the default mode network is um, part of the brain that, that, that is involved in consciousness. Um, I don't know how, and I don't know when, um, say you're using a different part of the default mode network because of brain damage, um, how that would be read in terms of these two models I'm presenting. So, I would it would seem like it had characteristics of both. Is what I, you know, like, just kind of why why can't there be elements of A and elements of B? It seems like a bit of a Venn diagram between those two models from a neurological point of view of the tiny bit of neuroscience that I've looked at. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, don't no, know. no, not at all. I <clears> I <throat> wish I could. I yeah. wish I. It's it's a good point. It's, it's a, a great point. I the school. Pardon? It's a shame they've abolished the School of Neuroscience in ANU. Yeah. Because you. Oh, okay. I just want to make a comment. 
I'm trying to right. please. Uh, please, everyone, if you're asking a question or having a discussion, Sorry. please speak up. This mic that Robbie's holding is only for this input to our Zoom <coughs> session. So we need to speak up so everyone in the room can hear us. Well, I'd like to ask thank you. Question. Thank you like very much for that. Yep, Robbie. Um, I was I was really interested in this idea that the pure awareness might not be possible, because I think, um, for example, in Buddhist meditation, there's a uh, a vast uh, heritage of the uh, use of pure pure awareness as a high state of of consciousness. And so I, I felt that the sort of examples that were being discussed in the building block model of sensory perception as the model of consciousness, you know, seeing the, uh, <clears throat> the thing and uh, you know, smelling and, and, and hearing and, and, and so on, were just very superficial as far as the meaning of consciousness and I'm in particular I, I, I did I, I they were they were kind of concrete examples yeah. that I used but I did yeah. kind of go through what states of consciousness are and they're things like perceptions emotions sensations uh, thoughts and arguably cognitive things which is like suddenly remembering something or whatever and they're they're the things which are going to be the contents of consciousness they're either thing sensations we're feeling inside their perceptions or and, and that's that's really the sum total of the things that can be conscious so you see, this is where the uh, the sort of Jungian model of consciousness grounded in the symbolic archetypes of the collective unconscious is really very different from the model that comes out of the uh, mind brain uh, community theory and it, in particular it's about the presence of the past in the present how our memory constructs constructs culture at a collective level in a way that that these sorts of reduction to the brain just really don't engage with that whole i suppose deeper meaning of consciousness yeah, but I, what, I, I want to know what you mean when you say consciousness. When you when you just use the word consciousness, can you define what that means to you? Because I I've pretty well spelt out how I'm using consciousness. I, I say I'm using phenomenal consciousness. I'm saying it's got a qualitative aspect and a subjective aspect, and I've told you the type of things that can be conscious, which is sensations, perceptions, emotions. You know, and when you just use the word conscious, then can you can you tease apart? Actually, do you understand what I'm saying? What conscious is? I'm just suggesting that cognition is really central to consciousness, much more so than perception, sensation. That a cognition is about our cultural heritage, about a sort of high vision of consciousness. Well, I put, um, and I was talking a bit to Theodora about this. Um, now, I, now, and I'm just a student, okay, but uh, there are models in cognitive science about how the brain works. And some people will say that perception is modular, which means it's kind of like a, it can be used a little bit of information goes in and information comes out and then some people say that cognition can't be understood that way because our beliefs are all connected to each other so you can't just have this little bit of information going in being processed in a black box like a computer thing coming out again cognition is different to that and then there are these there's a discussion going on at the moment and i just uh did a course on this but people and this seems really obvi obvious but but it's not the, the argument is going on at the moment so the idea is that cognition affects perception in a you know in quite a substantial way um so that you know the idea is if you're in a bad mood you're going to perceive something uh it is going to the color will look different for example so your your cognition will affect perception 
so that uh, your perception is not just this computational input of information and output of information. And so that's what you're saying, you know, you're, so you're saying your, I'm saying a mood, but you could say something, your cultural heritage or whatever is going to make your perception different. So your perception is not just this kind of um, input output thing. It's, it's it, your perception, it, it changes depending on your cognition. And that's a conversation or an argument that's going on at the moment. And there are people, you know, and the way they try and test these things is by doing experiments. For example, I mean, the idea is, um, see if I can think of an example, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to make a mess of it, but no, I won't, I won't try, but uh, so the mind is not a blank slate. Like we have. No, a, no I'm not we, suggesting we it a, is. But this gets to the point that we have a spiritual identity. I suppose that's what, that's where you're coming into conflict with a lot of the um, uh, uh, psychological uh, science, just the idea of spiritual identity. Um, and that's something where cultural heritage creates consciousness in a group. But, but is that what you're, is what you're saying, if I understand you in the context of the way I'm understanding it, is that, you know, I'm using the example of perception, but my, my perception is going to be affected by my, you know, by my, my spiritual identity, by my culture and by my whatever. It's like, uh, look, I think the way we see the world is definitely affected by those things. I, you know, I, I don't argue with that, but I'm just saying that it is, as far as understanding how the brain processes, you know, this, the, these are these are things that have to be, if you give credence to scientific findings and our scientific under, understanding of the world, then these things have to be tested in, in, in psych labs. You know, we have to kind of find out you know, we don't know how the brain processes things, you know, it's, this is ongoing work. But I, I mean, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't disagree with you. I, I, of course, the way we perceive the world is coloured by, you know, I mean, I perceive the world, it's coloured by my trauma, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> Can I just say, um, you're assuming that I have to stand up because I can't see. You're assuming that everybody has, in who are con who's conscious, has cognition. Has how do you know how a very disabled autistic person, for instance, has the cognition to behave or do what they do? How do you know that an autistic person who can't speak for themselves or somebody with um, cerebral palsy, for instance? can communicate through the normal channels so that how can a cognitive scientist test that out um yeah and look i first of all thank you very much and i don't disagree with you so thank you robbie um i i guess you know the, there's no point arguing with me. I'm just I'm reading. I'm not arguing with you. I'm asking. Oh, yeah. I, I'm just reading the stuff yeah. and they lean on the science and i guess i'm talking about um uh normal consciousness in a lot of cases and then when you talk about these other cases i don't know what the answers are you know so i don't know it's not my area of expertise what cognition is like if someone has um you know autism i don't know i haven't studied it but you know I so, so if, if a child with cerebral just cerebral palsy for instance very very disabled um and this actually happened because i have this teaching in school a long time ago, take them to the to the lake and tell them about the ducks and hear some breath. And don't, isn't it a beautiful day? And they looking all around and they take the whole of the bread and you can feed that to the ducks and the child feeds it to the ducks. Now, are you saying that that's not cognition? No, I'm not saying. No, that. so what I'm saying is, what I'm, I'm formulating this, I'm not criticising, I'm formulating this as a question in my own mind for us all to think about. 
Robert saying the spiritual, we get we go into the spiritual aspect. Is that for a what of a better word? Of what is this wider understanding or wider of non-understanding of what who we sentient beings actually are? Yeah. I, I think, I don't know if this helps to answer, but I think we, uh, and I'm talking about humans, yep. but I, I don't discount other animals. Sure. No, you know, I'm not saying but that. But uh, one idea is that we, we have a narrative self, which is... Yeah. Um, a private self, a public self, all of that. A, a narrative self is how we understand ourselves over time. So whilst memories of my past may not be conscious at the moment, you know, I, I have a sense of who I am and my identity over time, um, and I can draw on those memories, you know. And so I have this kind of narrative or autobiographical self. And, you know, I don't know because I, I haven't researched autism or anything like that, but maybe you could, maybe the, you, you could look at the narrative self differently or whatever, or the, the level of understanding. You know, I, in in the context of my talk, it's like an interesting question. I mean, I know autism is a, is a, a, a broad spectrum, but you know, if that's a broad spectrum, and I'm talking about these different ways or different modes of consciousness, you know, then is um are there parts on that spectrum that you you would you would class together as a mode or way of being conscious and one of the dimensions of these different modes has to do with the self how, and our unity and how the self is experienced. So uh, maybe in that case, there's a, the, the narrative self is experienced differently and cognition is experienced differently than uh, for, 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 for neurotypical sort of people. Um, but you know, it's it's not something I. I mean, obviously, autism is different to to neuro. Uh, someone with autism is is that is working their mind is working differently to a neurotypical person, and I, I don't know on what dimensions in terms of what I'm talking about how those dimensions are different, and I'm sure there's this you know sliding scale of it as well but maybe the self has something to do with it as a guess yeah. all i'm saying is that if you have a if you have a cultural self and you spent your entire life from birth in a wheelchair with an inability to communicate to other people but you have a consciousness how do we know how big that consciousness is yeah. and i'm thinking of the story of annie's coming out and how that that girl back in the 1980s was discovered by a teacher in, a, in an institution who, who she taught her to breathe in the end and she went to university and she couldn't speak a word and she had cerebral palsy. I, I, I worked as a respite worker and I worked yeah. with a couple of profoundly disabled young women. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand the disability you're I, talking I'm about. I'm simply suggesting that we need to ponder on these things. I don't have an answer. I'm simply throwing out questions, really. I guess this is, look, to, to tie this in a bit to consciousness, um, I can't experience your consciousness or anyone else in this room. I can only, this is this, this kind of problem of other minds. I have my conscious experience and I just make the assumption that you're all got kind of a similar conscious experience. Because otherwise, you know, it would be like I'm the only one conscious and I'm the sure. only thing in the universe. And, so you know, we, have, we have two questions from people on Zoom. Okay. So yeah. anyway, but, but thank you. I, I hope just want to rub the in the words. Yeah, no, I hope <laughs> I can respond. To about okay. So I suggest that we take these two uh, Zoom questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, they're from Lizzie Sage and Rajiv Singh. So we'll uh, take the question from Lizzie Page first. And uh, Lizzie says, thanks, Shauna, I have a question. Where does normative dissociation fit into the model? So for example, I am driving a car and I zone out. Yeah. I am not aware of what I am doing, but I am still operating the car. Yeah, um, oh, this is, this is, the this stuff is all in the philosophy of mind literature, um, and I should know better, but <laughs> there are different 
theories of consciousness and there's an example of the the long distance truck driver who um, kind of zones out and are we conscious in those cases um, uh, um, and there's a whole lot of literature on this and there are different theories of consciousness um, where you can be absorbed in something and uh, you're conscious of that thing or to be conscious you need this kind of higher order awareness you need to be aware of yourself being conscious of something and I should be able to answer this because the philosophers all talk about this um, and if I paid more attention when I read my philosophy <laughs> books, I'd have a great answer for you. But it, it, it is, it, it's all in the literature. It's these long distance truck drivers is the thought in, in the example of it and, you know, it, of whether that's conscious or not. Because the, the idea, I think some ideas it, is that we can have unconscious perception and that seems counterintuitive. We think perception has to be conscious but the idea is when you're looking at the road and you're not aware of it, there is this unconscious, the brain is processing the information, but you may be thinking of making dinner or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you're consciously kind of absorbed in that thought, but um, there, there is this processing going on, otherwise you'd be kind of crashing. But when something happens and you know, you, you it, something brings you back into the moment, if something, out, out of the ordinary happens or whatever. So I think um, there are people who argue we, we have unconscious perception and unconscious processing that's going on. So let's go on to the next okay. question then from Rajiv Singh. Uh, Rajiv writes, great presentation, Sean, thank you. A question, is there some discussion in the literature regarding where consciousness resides? in the right or left brain. For example, Ian McGilchrist talks about self-consciousness is the left brain inspecting the light of the right brain. Okay. Um, yeah, this, um, this, this left brain, right brain stuff is not so much talked about, although, you know, there are different, um, Look, the model I gave when I when I talk about the neural correlates of consciousness, and I was talking about the thalamus and parts of the cortex that are at, and these certain subcortical structures, and there are just certain structures that um, I don't know the names of, and I really should. But um, I, when I gave this talk uh, to the students. At uni, I, I was hassled in the question time, rightly so, by one of the students who said, you know, in the last few years, there is a more complex way of looking at these neural correlates. I mean, I explained it in, in quite a simplified way, he thinks, so I, in terms of, uh, so if you're going to find how I'm processing a face, you're going to have some activation in my face processing part of my visual cortex and the thalamus or whatever and he's saying you know there's a lot more crossover in this processing so that there's a lot more complexity in all of the processing as i said these neural correlates are the minimum set of neural activity so it doesn't mean that's all the processing that's going on in the brain it's the minimum set for that specific state okay so that's the idea of the neural correlates but um the the right left hemisphere sort of conversation that goes on is kind of, a, it, it's a, it might be in popular science, but I, I don't think people really talk about that so much in the literature. They, they don't really talk about the right and the he left hemisphere in as simplified terms as where, you know, some, some people like to discuss it. So it's not, in the stuff I'm reading, they don't really talk about it that way. And it's like, yes, the, the, like language is processed more on the left and spatial stuff more on the right. And, you know, but I don't think these are kind of different. I, I, I mentioned the split brain cases where um, these two hemispheres can't communicate and they seem to be distinct hemispheres. But 
when they respond, like the left hemisphere can respond in language and the right hemisphere seems to respond in pictures or whatever. Um, but I don't, I don't think generally people kind of think that we, we have these two hemispheres that are two personalities kind of, you know, uh, it's not really that simple. Brain processing is not really that simple. It's not really talked about. Uh, in the literature I read. I don't know if that was a, a, a good enough answer. I'm sorry. Um, is that okay? <laughs> sure, this is not really a question, it's an observation. Uh, you see in so many fields of research and political philosophy and uh, jurisprudence um, that quite a few research areas finish up in a polarity, it's either this or this. And uh, when you kind of hear that, you, you, you ask yourself the question, well, is that fundamentally right? I mean, in a philosophical sense, you, you hear the traditional question, is human nature basically good or evil? And then you could very well answer yes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the, uh, the way that this topic's been presented in terms of building blocks, and um, if you like an integrated uh, holistic kind of model um, seems to me that there are arguments partly in favor of each of them which suggests maybe there's a, a broader frame of reference yeah i guess so i i, I mean look great jim i i guess i i i just read i looked very closely at this paper by Tim Bain, and it was written a while ago, but he, they've written more work, obviously more work's been written. It's a really great paper though. And I guess the idea is we have these theories, we can't explain consciousness by science because th there seems to be a difference between this kind of first person experience and the physical matter that, you know, gives rise to it. And there are these different theories that, that seem to suggest there's this kind of field, unified field, which is subjective and that, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's really saying, you know, or, or even the difference, you know, is consciousness generated by this one system or multiple systems? I think, I mean, I think there are two approaches here that are really, that are distinct and that I think it's a, a worthwhile question to ask. and. If they come together, um, I guess if there's some way of, I, I don't, I was about to say if there's some way of combining them or, or having um, aspects of both in, in a model, I mean, um, I don't know, perhaps, you know, are they asking really opposite things that can't be combined or is there kind of this further model that will develop out of them? You know, I, I don't know, <laughs> but it's a good point. Yeah, I'll try this. Uh... Um, am I, am I yeah. um, you know, we spend a third of the time with our phenomenal consciousness drinking. Uh, what, what kind of um, attention is given in the philosophy of consciousness to our drinking consciousness, what we also perceive and feel and so on? Yeah, I, I haven't read much on it. Is it, all, is it all studied or is um, it just ignored? Uh, I, there would be people writing on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I've, I'm not reading about it. Yeah. Um, I guess, but when you say definitely, like the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is kind of the go-to, it's an online encyclopedia, yeah. and it's kind of the go-to for when you want a, an overview of something that you don't know about. Right. Having said that, it's it's complex and hard to read. The entries are very long, but th there's no entry on altered states of consciousness, and the reason is you don't get an entry in there until there's kind of a significant amount of material being written on something, and there just hasn't been a lot written yet to get an entry in there, and and you kind of think, oh, how could it not have this entry? But yeah, you know, so it's an entry everywhere else, but <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, but so an entry will happen because I mean, 
there is work being done on altered states of consciousness, but it's just taken time for, for people to get an interest. And even uh, I know of a PhD student, I know him, he did something on uh, inner voices, like you're, you're in a monologue, you know, and that was kind of new material. And it kind of, it seems like, how could people not be writing about this? And so I think it takes time for, you know, people to, to become interested in these things. And with what I was going to say, with the altered states of consciousness stuff, I mean, there are people looking at out-of-body experiences. And so there, are, um, there, there is, this work is being, this, these sort of things are being looked at. So there would be people looking at dreaming. I, I'm just not reading that stuff. But there's extensive work on that that's not recognised in the philosophical community. Yeah, but it's probably because it's not rigorous enough. That, you know, it's got to be, it's, it's got to be, they've got, they've got a certain way of uh, measuring what, what gets over the threshold of being rigorous. And, and that's, and a lot of that leans on science. You know, you've got to, you've got to kind of be leaning on the latest findings, making a good argument, using that science as premises of your argument, and it's got to be, you know, it, it, it's all got to be very credible and rigorous. And yes, there's a lot of stuff in, you know, new age sections of bookstores, but it's not going to be in a journal that only publishes peer reviewed stuff. So, you know. Well, maybe you can talk about that in the age of Aquarius. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't. I mean, I understand no one reads these journals in this period. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like. <laughs> but who sets the standard? That's the thing, you know. I mean, that there's, there's a standard that's been set by a group of very learned academics, um, and, and who, who sets the standard? I mean, well, what I, they do I, amongst themselves. It's a peer review well, process. I understand that. What I'm saying is that when I started my research journey, which was over 10 years, I started when it was everything was quantitative. And then after a while, and I wanted to do mixed methods research, and after a while, I look at phenomenological stuff. And I was held down for quite a while. But then gradually, over a period of about five years, they started reluctantly saying, all right, we can put qualitative in with quantitative. That's okay. We'll accept some mixed methods research. And what, what, what Richard is talking about is dreams, and dreams and imagery are very strongly related to each other. And I train in the psychotherapeutic model of guided imagery and music, where people are induced into an altered state of consciousness. The music is put on, and it's, it's classical music. And, and the person, the, the recipient, then tells the therapist through the journey of this particular journey of music that's put together for particular reasons because the, 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 the therapist is told by the client what's wrong with them, um, what their images are. And very often, it stuns me how often that Helen Bond was so right with the kind of music she chose, like for instance, uh, deep you know, child trauma and that kind of thing, and how that music actually touched those sorts of things. Now, that's an altered state of consciousness where they're consciously talking, but they're in an altered state, but they're not dreaming. They, they can come out of it at any moment. Um, and I think it's similar, but there is quite a lot of research on the body method of guided imagery and music in the literature. So if you want to look that up. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. I. Um, one thing I was going to say in response to what you're saying then, but I, um, are you, did you want, um, I, I, I forget what I was going to say in response to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back to this. Like most other people, I don't have a question, and that's kind of what I want to say, that I kind of, I'm a little bit disappointed that the questions that have been asked haven't actually been about your presentation because I feel like a lot of what's being discussed here is extremely vast and each one of these questions can touch on extremely wide areas of research 
and you're not you can't possibly know all these things and so oh, i would have, i would have liked more questions that were actually relevant to um, I, what you've spoken I, about I, you know this is, yeah. i mean I, I appreciate that but you know we're yeah. we're all yeah. we're a family here it's you yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i just it's i don't you know, think i think i know the answers to yeah, this well, I'm, I'm doing my best but no thank you for that I, it, it, it it's i i mean i I like the conversation going wherever it does. It's difficult though, right? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, the like point is like, I don't have the answers. Yeah, you're having a lot of stuff thrown at you and I think it's, it's, it's a hard decision to take because any one of these these um, questions or statements could, we could discuss them for hours. You know. but, and you know, thank yeah. you for that. No but it's cool, I just we're, want, to, we're, want to give you some credit for what you've actually done, yeah. which oh, is actually yeah, to, try and, to try and mine out something which is actually really complex. So thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. but yeah. we, we, we talk about union stuff here and it's kind of why we gather so it's <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. Terry. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Thanks very much uh, uh, for your presentation. And, uh, um, you mentioned during the presentation mystics um, uh, and uh, their experience that they could uh, have a sense of uh, awareness of just awareness not being aware of, of any particular thing. And uh, and some of the mystics, so one of the questions was, to what extent um, is the scientific approach in the university able to deal with uh, the mystical experiences? And it also occurred to me that uh, some of the mystical experiences um, uh, since the notion of one mind or one consciousness uh, that pervades the universe um, and that all of our different forms of consciousness um, are, are elements or aspects of that one of that one mind uh, I mentioned that idea is probably beyond the, the scope uh, of, of discursive reasoning, which is the way the university goes about those things, but <clears throat> is it able to touch on it anyway? Yeah, uh, that, that, okay, so consciousness, we have trouble accounting for it physically, and so there are these other theories for, for how it fits into the universe, um, and there are, there are theories like panpsychism, which says that it's, it's pervaded throughout the universe, but it's kind of in the smallest, you know, quarks or whatever. And when it's consciousness, it means there's, there's this kind of subjective element or, you know, like it's kind of like you take a human and then you just turn, turn, it, turn it down, you go down through your amoeba or whatever, and you just turn it down and you, you kind of turn consciousness down, you know, so it's kind of very dim. It's not, not like our consciousness. And you, you have it spread throughout the universe. And the problem with that is that, you know, if you have these kind of tiny little particles with a bit of consciousness in them, how do you add them together to get the consciousness that we have, this macro kind of consciousness? And that's called the combination problem. And that's a problem with panpsychism. There's another theory called cosmopsychism, which is like panpsychism, but it's this kind of one consciousness. So personally, in my heart, I'm a cosmopsychist. <laughs> <laughs> this is one consciousness, okay? And then you have the problem, well, how do we have these kind of independent experiences that we have? Now, this is all really part of metaphysics. It's kind of like, well, what, you know, how is the universe, you know, what's the nature of reality? Um, I, I'm not going in that direction in, in my research, but there are people who do go in that direction. Um, one thing I would say, though, when you have this cosmopsychism, um, for me, you know, in my picture of reality, there, there is this, the universe is conscious, but there's, there's kind of an intelligence about that, and it kind of engages with us or cares about us or, you know, that's the, the kind of reality that I prefer. And, and I would say the philosophers probably don't have that. If they say the universe is conscious, they're probably not adding those kind of, you know, 
spiritual or religious ideas onto it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's really the same uh, ideas that uh, I don't think philosophers are really talking the way Meister Eckhart was. You know, I think, um, but ha but philosophers are, and you, there are philosophers really looking, you know, looking at these other answers and looking for other ways of understanding reality. I guess the. The argument we're saying is, you know, is the universe just physical, which is what scientists will say. The universe is just physical. And if you, the universe is just physical, then, you know, we have this kind of problem of, you know, well, but, but it seems so much more than that, you know, and well, if it's so much more, what is this more if there's this, there isn't this non-physical substance floating in another sphere or something? And there are philosophers who, who are pretty left of field. And, and this consciousness conversation is, is kind of the crux of this because consciousness is the one thing science can't account for, you know? Um, so it, it pro poses this real problem to this idea of physicalism. Um, and then it leads on to all these kind of ideas of consciousness throughout the universe. And, um, and some philosophers are more left of field and they're, they're, they're you know, kind of looking for answers, looking for ways to explain consciousness that doesn't reduce it to the physical. And then a lot of philosophers are physicalists and they're saying, no, we should be able to find theories that, that work with the brain, how the brain works, and they should be able to account for, for consciousness. Um, so this, it does tie in to spiritual questions, um, but it's kind of where, you know, people, um, the, the, the academic discussion around it is, and I, I definitely come from the left of field side of things, but I've, I've gone into the brain stuff because I felt I need to try and understand that, you know, to kind of temper my, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm. So, um, so I think this is, it's really fertile area. Um, I'm, I'm rambling. Yeah, just probably just last question specifically about well about your presentation <laughs> yeah thank you probably yes i asked exactly about your presentation because you are uh, show like a uh, uh, two types of conscious one is uh, like a cube based uh, conscious and other was is a field conscious and most of these models they try to be explained by perception a question would be, for example, if you completely shut down uh, external perception, you don't see, you don't hear, uh, you don't perceive anything, but you're still conscious. So, what model is it? Yeah, I don't know. Do I, you need model? Yeah, no, as a, that's what I'm saying, okay? So, you shut down perception, you've got sensation, you shut down sensation, you've got emotions shut them down shut thoughts down you're unconscious I yeah that, that i mean that's that's basically what, what i'm saying when when i argue that you can't have something without states is it i said to be conscious you you need these contents of consciousness or, or conscious states and once you get rid of perception emotion sensation thoughts and arguably cognitive stuff which is a bit kind of weird to understand you get rid of that, you're unconscious. They're, they're the things you're conscious of. And when the, when you're not conscious of them, you, you, you're not conscious, you've got nothing to be conscious of. So. But about yourself? Well. You, be conscious of your conscious. No, well, you, 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 when you're conscious of yourself, there, I mean, there must be contents of consciousness such as proprioception. People talk, I mean, for me, Myself, I very, I very strongly identify with the voice in my head, but I went to a talk and I said that to someone who got angry, who gave the talk, who said, you know, it's really like the self is really embodied. So um, when we have a sense of ourself, and once again, there are different, there, there's kind of a minimal self and there's this narrative self over the time. But you, you're, you're going to have a sense of your body, for example, that's it's going to be giving these kind of, feedback things, you know, you, you're going to get feedback or you, your sense of yourself is going to come through awareness 
of your body, your thoughts, your emotions, whatever. And, and when all of that's shut down, you're not going to be aware of anything. So again, not an expert at this. <laughs> thanks very much. You've done a brilliant job tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.